There hasn't been a day since March 2020 where COVID wasn't the subject of the news, where the narrative has been to follow the science, to ensure people's safety, of course. Well, what often seemed a plausible narrative to many is now collapsing because what was believed to be true is now possibly being proved to be based on exaggeration and misinformation. A recent story in the New York Post showed how throughout the pandemic, public health officials not only made mistakes, but insisted on perpetrating them even as new evidence and information came to light. Join us to discuss this is our political editor all the way from Turkey, Anka Sahin. Welcome, Anka. Hi, Michael. Now, it's fair to say that the world may have been taken for a ride and many experts look like they were also uh, pretty much fooled hook, line and sinker as well. What, what do you think? Well, look, as time goes on, um, new information is is coming to light uh, in relation to uh, a whole lot of different elements of the COVID-19 response, and not just in Australia um, and New Zealand, but globally. And, and some of that information is um, appears to be at least uh, in direct um, contradiction with what we were told, particularly throughout the first two years of the pandemic by our government's and um and officials and um and those who who were styling themselves as experts and whom the department the the government and and other um uh, official uh, bodies uh, decided to listen to as as experts in that in that process um told us during that uh, during those two years in, in particular and some of that information is now being superseded or or contradicted by uh, by new research that's coming out, um, and and also statistics, of course, uh, as well um, of um, relating to the harms uh, caused by um, the lockdowns and the travel restrictions and the impacts of those on um, uh, on on uh, you know delayed diagnosis of serious uh, conditions on mental health on education outcomes. Uh, on on small business, on the vitality of our cities, um, on on developmental delays in 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 children, so many different things are now beginning to be felt, and and that's all contributing to further questioning of um, of the narrative that was pushed on us uh, throughout the first two years of the pandemic, in particular. Mm. Now we've just recently seen data published. I think it was in the Spectator saying that excess. Deaths, so deaths above what would normally happen in the population, the highest ones, America, England, Australia, and New Zealand, more excess uh, mortality outside of the things, and yet we were some of the countries that locked down the most. And these come from some of them. We, we've interviewed many cancer specialists who are saying that diagnoses were down because screenings were down because we actually stopped that screening. And it's a basic mathematical equation where for every thousand screenings they do there are so many cases detected well of course when you don't have those thousand screenings those cases aren't detected until much later which leads to worsened outcomes um at what point do we go yep we got it wrong do you think we'll ever put our hand up anchor well this question about excess deaths has been around for some time uh, i remember it first appeared in the media some months ago when the actuaries institute crunched some numbers and um and they came up with uh with with figures showing that our excess deaths were increased compared to previous years and of course you know when that information first came out a lot of people assumed oh well yes of course there's been a there's been a global pandemic um it's only normal that we're seeing more deaths now compared to to previous years and you know before the pandemic and also the first uh particularly the first year of the pandemic when uh, australia had uh, close to you know very very few cases apart from uh, localized sort of outbreaks here and there um so people um naturally assumed that any excess deaths would necessarily be linked to uh, COVID-19 and the deaths caused by COVID-19 related infections and conditions. But in the same um, report, the Actuaries Institute actually pointed out that only 30% of the excess deaths related to 
um, to COVID-19 or conditions that may have been caused by COVID-19. So that still leaves us with 70% of the excess deaths, which are increased compared to previous years. And that increase doesn't seem to be just related to COVID-19 because as, as, as the Actuaries Institute said in, in that report, only 30% appeared to have come from COVID-19 and related conditions. So that still leaves us with 70%. And yeah, as you said, um, could some of it um, be, be related to delayed diagnosis of serious conditions like cancers? Um, and, 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 and are there, for example, elements of um, misdiagnosis of, um, of COVID-19 or, um, or other conditions that have become, that have been made worse because of the, the restrictions that were imposed on the people and the things that they were not allowed to do during, um, during particularly uh, 2021 and 2022. So all of these questions, and, and the Actuaries Institute didn't actually have the answers to, to those questions because they that's not part of their job. They're just crunching numbers and saying, look, this is what the numbers are telling us. But somebody else who is a public health expert or who are public health experts or who were behind these um, uh, restrictions that we had to put up with, particularly in 2021 and early 2022, uh, they they have to look at that information and say right we've got excess tests they're 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 more than pre what we had in previous years and only thirty percent appear to have come from COVID nineteen what's happening with the rest of the seventy percent what have we done wrong to end up with not only uh, more excess tests than before but also excess tests whose um, reasoning we, we cannot we cannot detect or establish mm. um i think it was just this week i interviewed uh professor nikolai petrovsky one of australia's preeminent vaccinologists endocrinologist uh has his own um covid vaccine in use over in iran uh it's based on the old protein um based vaccines um brilliant brilliant man he pointed out that Currently, we're in uh, an alternate universe where those countries, third world, underdeveloped countries like Africa, they've actually come through this pandemic better and they only had a 5 or 6% vaccination rate. They don't have the excess deaths. They didn't, COVID didn't sweep, sweep them. So if that's not a great control group compared to uh, developed countries, Australia, where we had 95% plus vaccination, and they're now suffering these, um, some would say, unexplained excess deaths. I don't know what is. Yeah, Africa is a very interesting example because everyone thought that um, with um, access to the vaccines that were available around the world being so much lower in um, in the whole of Africa compared to, to most other places, they would end up much worse off um, uh, from the pandemic, uh, quite the opposite happened. And some people tried to uh, explain that away by saying that, oh, you know, the weather is, you know, warmer in many parts of Africa and, you know, the population is younger and a lot of other viruses are circulating and therefore people have greater immunity, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, none of that is is all that scientific, really. Um, when you when you do an apples to apples comparison of of case numbers and and then the, the very same people who are saying those things about Africa are, were they were then saying you know back in the um, the height of the pandemic they were saying oh well we can't actually trust the numbers coming out of Africa because they don't test very much well yeah they and if that's if that's true and if their numbers are much much higher but the death rate is uh, is still low well how you know how is that to be explained. Uh, when there hasn't been the same level of vaccination in in most African countries compared to um, compared to the rest of the world, the other question that you you have also pointed out is um, again these mRNA vaccines that that have been used in many parts of the world they're not the only vaccines out there as as you said Nikolai Petrovsky he's um, he's a vaccinologist who's developed a, um, a vaccine he wasn't able to have it funded in um, in um, 
uh, in Australia and have it distributed in Australia. It is being used, as you said, in Iran. There are other vaccines out there, uh, Chinese-made vaccines and Cuban-made vaccines and, and, and a number of others uh, that are um, the old protein-based vaccines. And then you've got... Um, uh, you've got what they call the viral vector ones out there, uh, including AstraZeneca and uh, Sputnik and, and some of those other ones. Of course, not, not all of them were available in Australia. In fact, uh, there was no solely protein-based vaccine that was available in Australia. Um, Novavax came close, but the, even that wasn't that wasn't just uh, solely protein-based. So um, I guess one question that comes out of that discussion is how come... Uh, there are greater reports of uh, potential injuries and people reporting um, adverse reactions on a more um, uh, on a wider basis in countries that uh, either exclusively or primarily used mRNA vaccines compared to those countries where other types of vaccines were primarily or exclusively used. I think that's a that's a question that needs to be asked. Uh, we're not we're not experts in that, but we as lay people, we as members of the public, have a right to ask those questions because we happen to live in a country where um, the mRNA vaccines were the vaccines that were primarily used, not exclusively. But New Zealand in New Zealand, it was exclusively just Pfizer and nothing else. No Moderna, no AstraZeneca, nothing, just Pfizer. So New Zealand in that regard was, was, was an interesting example. So compared to countries like us, like New Zealand, where it was primarily the mRNA vaccines that were taken up by people. And when we compare our uh, the, um, the number of adverse reactions that are reported through the ATAGI process and through other processes that are available in similar comparable countries to... Um, what is being reported uh, in in countries that used other types of vaccines? I think this is this is a a, 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 um, a study that is yet to be done, uh, but it's a it's a it's a fair question, and and I think people in particular who felt uh, compelled or felt pushed or felt forced to take one of these vaccines um, have the right to know if there was a better alternative or a safer alternative that perhaps was not made available to, to us as the public. Yeah. And of course, let's not forget that uh, I, I keep referring back to it, but the former head of the AMA, uh, former um, government uh, minister, Karen Phelps, was suffering, herself and her wife were suffering severe vaccine injury while still pushing the mandate, and she's recently given given evidence at an inquiry saying that she felt compelled because of Targi were threatening deregistration and penalties, so she didn't speak up. Is the government got any right to expect um, compliance or trust with any further edicts that they may issue around this? If people like Karen Phelps, who are high profile, um, who have um, certainly the credentials, the background and um, and the gravitas to to speak about matters like this and who themselves are harmed. And it wasn't just, you know, she was she was um, injured by the vaccine and um, and her partner as well. So both of them were injured. And if somebody like her finds it difficult to speak up. I mean, she eventually did come out, of course, with with all of that information. But she's, of course, she's not the only one out there. Um, she made the news because she's so high profile, and that she was obviously not a person who was pushing this or who was um, making this publicly known for uh, in pursuit of some sort of an agenda. She was just stating the facts as they were and saying, look, this is what happened to me. There are people out there to whom this has also happened, and they do not feel as uh, as as empowered to speak out as I am because of you know my position as the the previous president of the AMA and also as an ex MP uh, who's reasonably well known in Australia. So when she speaks, people listen to her. Um, but there are many others out there, and these, you know, not just not just member of members of the public and ordinary people, but also 
people who are qualified doctors uh, like her, medical professionals, um, who still felt that they were being muzzled and they were being stopped from speaking out by APRA because of that infamous letter that they sent out to all doctors in April 2021 saying that if you, you know, say anything or do anything or uh, share anything in your um, uh, in your social media that may um, be construed as um, uh, as harming the, the vaccine rollout in Australia, uh, you, action could be taken in relation to your registration and, and perhaps your um, your livelihood could be threatened as a result of that. So um, and, and many people didn't didn't actually know this was happening. So they were going to their doctors asking for advice, asking for um, medical advice that they were then going to rely on to make decisions about themselves and how they were going to um, proceed. And, and not knowing at the same time that those doctors may not be in a position to speak freely or give advice, medical, give, give that medical advice freely. So where does that leave us with regard to the any advice we may have received from doctors, particularly in relation to these matters over the last two, three years, can can we go, can we actually rely on any of that advice? Or should we then say, well, no, that advice wasn't wasn't given as as you know free and frank advice. You know, we should go back and question it and maybe seek a second, third opinion from other doctors who who feel they're able to speak more freely it, it's it, it's it's really created a situation where people are very much questioning that relationship that they have which really should be sacred between patient and doctor yeah um one of the other um big ones was school closures anchor where we were told that we needed to protect our kids because the kids would transmit it to granny and kill granny and we we know full well now it's accepted that the vaccine didn't stop transmission but we also know that the risk versus reward for children it was about three times riskier to have the vaccine than what it was to get COVID so while there's nothing that's risk-free in medicine it's always risk versus reward how much do, wait or how much do we need to investigate that bit of misinformation and again let's Let's be really clear here. The government refuses to release the information, the science that they said they relied on. That was a whole narrative. We're relying on the best science and science tells us, and now they're fighting tooth and nail, not to have to release the science that they said drove their decisions. One thing that was known very early on um, was that children even if they do get COVID, firstly, they are um, not really uh, in, in any serious danger of developing um, complications. That's not to say that none of them will. Again, it comes down to that ratio of, um, of harm versus benefit and, and what, what we're prepared to do to minimize the risks um, and, and, and the actions that we take must not lead to results that are worse than what the what the potential harm is and and that's where i think that the problem comes particularly in relation to uh, school closures and uh, and any uh, sort of restrictions imposed on children so we knew where very early on um all the experts said that children are not as likely to get covid-19 or if they are if they do get covid-19 they are more likely to have no symptoms and um so Asymptomatic transmission was something that um, was subject of uh, considerable debate at the beginning. There were a lot of experts out there who were saying that if, if you're not showing symptoms, you are much, much less likely to pass it on. Um, but then those experts' views were sidelined and the governments around the world, particularly in Australia as well, um, were pushing this narrative that, oh, no, no, you could you could be showing no symptoms at all and still have fleeting transmission and and pass it on and and so on and so forth. Now, 
that that was that was being um that became the dominant narrative throughout those um particularly those days of the lockdowns and restrictions that you know we need to keep testing we need to lock down we need to keep people isolated we need to keep people who appear uh to be healthy, who test negative, who have no symptoms, we must still quarantine them if they come from overseas, because who knows, they might, uh, they, you know, the virus might still be germinating. And, and if they, um, you know, if they come into fleeting uh, contact with somebody, they might, they might transmit it. Well, later down the track, as, as restrictions loosened, we, that narrative began to change. And we got to a point where, oh, well, if you have no transmission, if, if you have no uh, symptoms, there's no need to test, there's no need to do anything. We'll just assume that you're healthy. Well, as we have always done throughout centuries of, of disease uh, throughout human history, we have assumed that, that people who present healthy, who have no symptoms are in fact healthy, right? Uh, particularly when it comes to respiratory viruses uh, of that are similar to to COVID-19. So that's where we are now, but we were that's that's not what was being pushed on us uh, throughout the uh, the days of the lockdowns and the restrictions and that then links to those restrictions that were pushed on our kids at school because in most cases kids wouldn't show symptoms. So if the narrative was oh well even if you don't show symptoms you could still pass it on well, then that's then used to justify those restrictions on children, making them wear masks, making them so socially distanced from one another, closing down schools if there is somebody who tests positive for whatever reason, um, and, and, and basically making them comply with all those restrictions um, on the basis that, oh, you know, even if you don't show anything, you can still be passing it on to your, your classmates who will then pass it on to their to their parents, but actually things did not did not pan out that way, and now that's being accepted. So today we live with the virus. Today, no one would dream of testing a child or even an adult who's showing no symptoms. No one would dream of telling them to isolate on the basis of returning a positive test but showing no res no no symptoms and having no obviously being quite well and, and not sick. Um, nobody would dream of doing that now. Yet in those days uh, of restrictions and lockdowns, that's exactly what was going on. And let's let's look back with the benefit of hindsight. For those who were supporting government saying they did the best they could, they knew, well, the best they could change is day by day as information comes to hand. Let's not forget Victoria especially. You could walk into a restaurant wearing your mask, sit down at the table, take your mask off. But if you had to get up to go to the toilet, you had to put your mask back on. Science. You could not travel further than five kilometres from your home. You're allowed outside for one hour to exercise, but you couldn't stop and sit on a bench. Science. You, you had police checking somebody's coffee cup to see if it had coffee because they had their mask off. You had planes full of people where you've got to keep your mask on until your food shows up. You're in a confined space and everyone can take their mask off to eat, but then you have to put your mask back on. Science, looking back in hindsight, really? Like at what point do you go, if they enforce that rule, what other rules do you, you know, do you really think they had the science to go? Like it, it's just, madness and if they were just scared and uninformed that's an even bigger worry where they've gone let's just do all of this stuff because we see the figures now for school refusal with kids we've seen the actual uh, data now for suicides and mental health we've seen bankruptcies and businesses fall over we've seen marriage breakdowns domestic violence and all of these unintended consequences that were as foreseeable is what they were preventable if they had a nuanced. The same with the border closed downs. I think it was Deborah Glass, the ombudsman, said Victoria's government was more about finding a way to keep people out of the state than facilitating a safe way to bring them back. So it was just, no one comes back, that's it, bad luck. Instead of going, right, meet at the border, marshal will test, back you go, isolated home. No, just no one can come back. 
People lost their homes, their businesses, loved ones died alone. Anchor, can we, if we don't examine this, how likely is it to happen again? A, a big lesson from all of it really should be uh, for next time, don't do anything until you have all the evidence available. I mean, the hysteria that was created by, by videos and reports that have since been shown to be false or exaggerated or just plain old theater. I mean, let's let's think back to to people falling <laughs> falling dead on the streets in China. That just that did not happen. I don't know. I don't have the answer to what was the reason what was the reason for somebody to push that sort of a narrative, somebody to stage that sort of thing. Why those people, if they were really dropping dead, why they were dropping dead, I don't know. But I know it's not COVID because COVID doesn't do that. I know that much. You know, I don't have to be a doctor or a specialist to know that. So those sorts of next time we see things like this, I think we need to stop, you know, and, and, and take a step back and say, wait, let's remember. Let's remember back to what happened in 2020. We were being shown videos. We were being shown um, reports that were then debunked. There were, remember, there were those photos of, um, of, of rooms full of coffins in, in Italy. And, and it turned out that it was from some sort of a disaster from a few years back. All of these things, we must stop and say, wait, let's not do anything until we know more. Anka, we've got to leave it there. Great way to finish. And let's not forget Galileo, Darwin, they were they were dissenters. They spoke out. Galileo spent the last nine years of his life in jail. You know, we yeah. need scientists that are brave enough to uh, battle the bureaucrats. Anka, we've got to leave it there. Great to speak to you. And we'll chime in again next week. No problem.